On the shiny side or the air side of the drum as they make the ED copper, uh, what they do in this case for reverse treat is they actually apply this thermal treatment that I was talking about uh, that's usually at the substrate copper interface. They actually apply that treatment to the shiny side. So hmm. now you have the benefit of this thermal um, barrier, so to speak, and also a bond enhancer that's on a smoother side of the oh. copper. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the On Track Podcast. It's Judy Warner, and we're so glad to have you again. And today we'll be joined by John Coonrod, who's the Technical Marketing Manager at Rogers Corporation. Today, we're going to talk about copper, all about copper. We're going to talk about how copper is made, the different types of copper that are available, and how it impacts your designs and performance of your PCB design. So lean in, enjoy. I'll see you on the other side. Welcome to All Team's On Track Podcast, where we talk to leaders about PCB design, tackling subjects ranging from schematic capture all the way to the manufacturing floor. I'm your host, Judy Warner. Please listen in every week and subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, and all your favorite podcast apps. And be sure to check out the show notes at altium.com forward slash podcast, where you can find great resources and multiple ways to connect with us on social media. Hi, John. Thanks so much for joining us again. And we're really glad to have you back. Glad to be here. So last time we did the podcast, John, you know, we came up with this idea. You had talked about copper types, and I've had the pleasure of being in the Rogers factory in Chandler and was just overwhelmed with, you know, looking at the various types of copper and all that. So I thought it'd be really helpful to our audience to, to go a little deeper in the weeds and, right. you know, teach design engineers how this copper is made. And that's important, obviously, because of the performance. But before we start going down that rabbit hole, can you tell our audience a little bit about your role there? And then I thought it'd be interesting to share sort of a little bit about the lab you work in. Oh, uh, yeah. sure. So why don't you give us a thumbnail sketch of that? I'll be happy to. So my title is technical marketing manager, but it's not real descriptive of what I do. So I'm really a, uh, a technical resource for the marketing department, myself and my group. And we really support uh, RF or high-speed digital type of concerns. So we look at a variety of different things. If customers have a simulation that's not working the way they think, or the circuit performance doesn't match a simulation, we get involved with that. We get involved with looking at a lot of new materials with uh, our R&D department as well and our innovation center. Uh, we actually work with universities. We work with a lot of different uh, technical communities around the world, actually. So we're really a, uh, a technical resource for the marketing department and uh, heavily involved with RF and high-speed digital. As for our lab, uh, we have a pretty good lab, actually. On the RF side, we have a network analyzer that's capable of a single suite from 10 megahertz to 110 gigahertz. Along with that, I have time domain options so I can make it act like a TDR. And uh, mm. across that range of frequencies, when you use it as a TDR, it's extremely accurate just because you have such fine resolution at that wide band. Um, we also have a lot of other things that are access in our lab that is part of the R&D lab that's near us. So we have SEMs, we have all kinds of fun stuff that goes along with our equipment. Uh, besides the network analyzer, though, we also have equipment to measuring PIM, passive intermodulation. That's a whole different topic I'm not going to touch on today. <laughs> and, uh, and we also have uh, thermal uh, imaging cameras like FLIR, thermal imaging cameras. And we do uh, have power amplifiers. And with the combination of the power amplifiers and the circuits and the thermal imaging camera, we also look at thermal management issues as well. And then mm -hmm. on high-speed digital side, we have a new software that uh, links very good with our network analyzer. It's a, a PLTS software from Keysight, and that allows us to convert our S parameters or uh, coming off the network analyzer into high-speed digital concerns like uh, understanding rise time, uh, delay, uh, eye diagrams. You can do uh, PAM4 eye diagrams. So you can do a lot of really interesting stuff with it. And uh, so we're pretty well equipped, actually. And we, like I said, we do work with a lot of uh, academic people as well. So a lot of times uh, the practical side and the academic side is mm, sometimes two different things. The basics yes. are always the same, of course. But yeah, when you actually try to apply some of the theory in real world, you run into things like copper. 
because copper is not quite as simple as what people think sometimes. No, and it seems so basic, but yeah, that's I why I wanted to have you back because you've taught me and some other people at Rogers have taught me about the complexity. And again, once I had the opportunity to visit your plant back when you guys did that plant tour at IMS some years yeah. back, sure. I was overwhelmed and a got to, to see your fancy VNA that I think was oh, yeah. new at the time. Yeah, I think it was. <laughs> and so I, I just thought it would be really helpful insight to design engineers. Sure. Um, so let's start off with the basics. So there's two basic types of copper rolled right. mm -hmm. and electro deposited. So why don't you talk about those a bit and how each one is made um, for our audience. I want to let you know that there are a few places during this podcast where John will be uh, showing a slide. So you can always go over to the Altium's YouTube channel and see that. So you can see his images. Um, but he will be very careful for those who just have access to audio to talk through that carefully. So, right. Yeah. I'll try to be very descriptive. And if I'm not, then, you know, tell me to get more descriptive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, so the first slide I'm showing, I think, can you see my slide? Okay. I can. Good. So this is a very simple illustration of how rolled copper is made. And uh, I'm not a copper manufacturing expert, so I'm going to give you the basics. Uh, but really what this is showing is that we start off with a billet of pure copper and it goes through a series of rolling processes, kind of a calendaring process, but a little more elaborate than that. But you go from a very thick copper billet, uh, getting milled rolled all the way down to the copper foil thickness that you want. And that's rolled copper. And just by the nature of how that works, the grain structure uh, of the copper grains and the boundaries is very much different than ED copper, electrodeposited copper. And I'll talk about the, the grain structure here in a second. Uh, but this next slide I'm looking at, <clears throat> excuse me. And this is in regards to making ED copper, electrodeposited copper. And for those in the printed circuit board industry, you probably recognize this. This is basically a plating bath. So we have this titanium drum, that, drum that's very large, extremely smooth. And we essentially plate copper onto the drum. And then depending on how fast the drum rotates, that's how thick the copper is going to be when you pull it off. So thicker copper is going to take longer time, thinner copper quicker. One side of the copper is going to be really smooth, and that's going to be next to the drum. The other side of the copper is going to be rougher, and that roughness is really just due to how the um, the the plating process behaves. And you get in a um, like a microsection or a z-axis picture, what you get for a grain structure is actually vertical. So it's uh, like a pickup fence you might think of. And then back on the rolled copper, it's the opposite, actually. It's actually uh, grain structures laying down uh, parallel to, the, um, to the, the, the plane anyway. So you actually have something very different for grain structure on rolled copper than you do ED copper. And that affects uh, etching sometimes for how accurate you can etch the conductors. And it actually affects uh, flexibility, affects several different things. But that's just a quick overview of the two main types of copper and the ED coppers that are out there now. Uh, there's a lot of really sophisticated ED copper where when you look at, these uh, coppers in a microsection, they don't look as picket fence anymore. They're more of a random grain structure and they're doing that purposely to get uh, some benefits out of that. So there's a lot of new tricks in the last several years uh, with making the ED copper. And um, all ED coppers are not the same, all rolled copper is not the same, but that's kind of a quick overview of how, how the copper is made. Is, is that okay? okay. Think? Yeah, I think that's good. I'll no. have a lot more questions for you later, but I think that's sure. a good overview to start with. Sure. So I think um, it would be helpful there to now to talk about um, some of those issues like reverse treated. And you mentioned on the titanium drum, that side being very smooth, right? right. And the side that's plating on is being rougher. Right, right. Is mm -hmm. the rolled copper, I mean, I know on the drum, it's super, super smooth. Oh, yeah. When it's rolled, you know, how smooth are those surfaces compared to, say, the type that's the ED copper on the side of the drum? 
Yeah, yeah, that's a good question because uh, the rolled copper is about the same surface roughness on both sides of the copper just by the nature of how, it, how it's made. And due to how they make it and their choice of rolling mills, they can control the surface roughness uh, uh, some amount. But generally speaking, just by the nature of the beads, it's going to be pretty smooth. Uh, okay. So usually rolled copper on average has a surface roughness of 0.35 microns RMS, so root mean square. Uh, and that's one way to measure the surface roughness. And then the ED copper on the shiny side is a little rougher than that, but not much. The shiny side usually averages around 0.35 to 0.4. Hmm. Uh, so it's pretty close to pretty the Pretty comparable. Copper. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the the roughened side of the ED copper can vary a lot depending on how the copper is made in the process and all that. It could be two or three times that roughness. But I remember from my my tenure in the board industry that some of that roughness is desirable because right. it helps with adhesion, right? Exactly. To the, to the um, bare laminate, right? Right. Yep. So why don't we talk about that, sure. you know, sort of, and, and I know you um, wanted to talk a little bit about re reverse treated. Oh, right, right. Thanks. Copper. Uh, yeah. So reverse treated copper. Um, well, let me back up a second and talk okay. about the roughness real quick. Okay. So roughness does have a couple of effects. One, you're absolutely right. The rougher the copper, the more bond area, basically. So as you bond to this roughened copper, you definitely get better appeal strength uh, for the most part. There's always weird exceptions here and there, but uh, that's generally a good statement. There's also treatments that they apply to the copper and uh, usually the side of the copper that is the air side when the laminate is made, uh, they usually put a passivation treatment on there that is just to protect the copper so it doesn't oxidize before someone grabs the laminate and makes a circuit out of it. And then the mm. other side of the copper that's at the interface of the substrate copper interface, there's a, a very large variety of treatments they put there and it's for different reasons sometimes. But some of these treatments are more sensitive to temperature than others. And the, some of our processes for making like a, a laminate based on PTFE are very high temperature. And because of that, some of these metals that are used as a treatment there uh, they actually convert to other alloys or something else, and that can actually affect the long-term bonding. So we actually have to understand the, the treatment very well and how that interfa interfaces with the, um, or interacts with the, uh, the dielectric it's being bonded to. So the reverse treatment is uh, a kind of a neat trick that's been around for a long time. And really what that is, it's usually ED copper. I have to think about that. It's always ED right. copper. Right, it's always ED, <laughs> yeah. I think, yeah. 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 I'm so tracking anyway, with you. <laughs> good. <laughs> so anyway, on the shiny side or the air side of the drum as they make the ED copper, uh, what they do in this case for reverse treat is they actually apply this thermal treatment that I was talking about uh, that's usually at the substrate copper interface. They actually apply that treatment to the shiny side. So hmm. now you have the benefit of this thermal um, barrier, so to speak, and also a bond enhancer that's on a smoother side of the oh. copper. So that's a cool trick. And then the other side that is just naturally roughened, that is the air side of the laminate. And one of the first things a fabricator will do a lot of times is they will uh, grab the laminate and as they're making inner layers or whatever, they're gonna need to put photoresist on. And photoresist adheres extremely well to that roughened side. Mm -hmm. So you get a much better bond uh, to the roughened side. And then on the reverse treated side, that's the copper substrate interface. It's actually smoother, but it still has that bond enhancement um, uh, benefit and then being smoother is a benefit to RF and high speed digital for much lower insertion loss. Right. So the, the reverse treat is kind of the best of two worlds, you might think of, because rougher copper is usually good for peel strength reliability, but rougher copper usually hurts the insertion loss. Yes. Now you can actually have a little smoother copper uh, that's bonded very well with the dielectric and you have better performance with insertion loss and digital and all that kind of stuff. So does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. So oh, I have God. questions about that. So oh, no I didn't know about what I recall and maybe things have changed since, you know, my, my board days, but a couple of things. One, I didn't know that that treatment had thermal properties or um, adhesion oh. benefits. Cause I remember people desiring that reverse treated for, right. you know, insertion loss reasons mm -hmm. and, and having that super smooth interface between the substrate and the copper. Right. But then there were always complaints about yeah. peel strength, right? And they don't want their, 
their uh, traces to lift or whatever mm-hmm. the case may be. Is that new or is that just something I missed along the way? And sort of what could you talk about what that peel strength is with that sure. interface? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's nothing new, actually. Uh, it's okay. been around for a few decades, but it's usually not oh. talked about that much unless you're making laminates, and we know about it very well. Okay. Uh, and one reason I say that is because what we find is some of these treatments that are good thermal barriers that helps the laminate survive very long uh, thermal exposures, like in a, a hot environment, Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, those thermal barriers actually um, can make a difference on how it bonds and cross-links t- to the substrate. And in some cases, these substrates are not friendly to it, and you will get zero peel strength if you try to bond to certain metals with certain substrates. Even though it's very rough and surfaced, it, it just won't make a good bond. So when we do an evaluation on copper, it's a lot more than just the roughness itself. It's also the treatment and how it interacts with the substrate that we're bonding to it. And then long-term what happens as well. So there's uh, a lot of different things to consider there. Um, I'm sorry, but I think I went down a different path than what you asked. <laughs> Could you ask that well, again? no, it's, <laughs> it's all related. So okay. right now I find myself thinking, and forgive me if I take us out on a side trip too, but okay. I find myself thinking of our audience right now. And it's like, okay, great, you guys, all this stuff you're talking about, but how do I pick? Oh, right yeah, yeah. for my design right. and my application. So when it comes to ED rolled copper reverse treated, how do you know when to go which way or another? Um, Is I that's probably just such an unfair question, but <laughs> yeah, are there a- certain let me ask you this way are there certain oh. applications that lend themselves more to one over another? Yeah, normally what I would say is if the application is lower frequency, uh, then you would lean on the high on the side of a rougher copper to get much better peel strength, better reliability, things like that. So at lower frequencies, the rough and copper does not make as big a difference on insertion loss and other RF or high-speed digital performance issues, mainly because of skin depth. So at lower frequencies, when the skin depth is very thick, uh, then the amount of current that's in the copper is uh, you actually using a good portion of the copper. Once you get to higher frequencies and the skin depth is thinner, then the RF current is just using the skin, so to speak, and it's the roughened surface. Right. So if it's high frequency, especially millimeter wave, that's when you really got to consider uh, copper that's much smoother because that does make a big difference at you know, high frequencies like that. So there is a lot more to the trade-offs there, but I think that's a good yeah. way to think about it. Okay, that makes a lot of sense to me. So I've seen pictures you know, for our audience that may have not, um, may be inching into higher frequencies and this hasn't been a concern before. If, if you don't know about it, I'll see if I can find some good links or maybe John has some that talks about skin depth because oh, right. the signal, what it does is it kind of hugs the bottom part of the circuit, which is right where the interface is between the laminate and the copper right? And yep. that's where you have a problem. So that's how high frequency performs, but lower it's more near the top side. So you don't get, I don't yeah. know, I'm not going to say roughness. Te- the yeah. roughness. You're not going to matter get, as much. Yeah. Yes. So anyways, John, maybe you can share. Um, yeah, do you I have anything? Of, I got a couple of pictures I can share, not necessarily skin depth related, but it does show the roughness and I can talk to that a little bit better maybe. So what I'm showing really is uh, two sides of an ED copper foil. This is a copper foil with a roughness of about 2.0 microns RMS. And I'd have to say that's like an average roughness. It's not really smooth. It's not really, you know, high profile rough. Mm -hmm. But what you can see on the treated side, which are the top two pictures, uh, just different magnification, that uh, there's a lot more tooth there, so to speak. So there's a lot more surface area and you're going to, whatever's bonded to that's going to have a lot more area to bond to. So you have pretty good peel strength. Mm-hmm. The shiny side is uh, the drum side as the copper's made, and that's much smoother. Um, and then maybe I can do show you another picture of SEM photos. Can you see that? I can. And again, for yeah. our audience, I recommend you go over and take a look of this podcast on YouTube because he has a, some really great visuals that will really help you understand this. Cool. Okay. Good. good. Uh, yeah, my computer is doing some funny things here. 
Uh, but anyway, uh, what I'm looking at now are three pictures of SEM photos of the top view looking straight down on the copper itself. And the upper left picture is rolled copper, and you can see there is a directionality to it. And that's just because hmm. of the rolling process. And those rolling mills do have, they're very smooth, like I said, but they still do have a little bit of uh, texture to them. And you do get a, um, a green direction, so to speak, with the copper. Well, one direction is a little bit rougher than the other. But it's usually pretty smooth and 0.4 microns RMS that we're noting here, that's considered very smooth for copper in the printed circuit board industry. Mm -hmm. To the right of that is the uh, more average roughness, I'd say about two microns RMS and that's ED copper. And you can see the nodules there are, you know, big and bulky, I guess. This is at about 2,500X magnification if I remember right. And then the bottom picture is a high profile ED copper, the uh, 2.8, microns RMS. And uh, you can see there's a lot more bonding area, of course, but it's also going to cause more insertion loss too. Uh, but that's part of the trade-off. So at low frequency, you know, the 2.8 microns RMS, no problem. You could uh, get really good fill strength, good reliability, but it's going to cause more insertion loss. So when you go to higher frequency where insertion loss is usually more of a concern, then you might want to switch to a smoother copper. And reverse treat copper, which is not shown, would be between the 0.4 and the 2.0. It should be about 0.9 to 1.0, depending. Some of them are better than others, but that's kind of the roughness anyway. Is there a cost differential between these types of coppers? Right. Yeah, there is. So rolled copper, just uh, again, by the nature of how it's made, is a kind of an expensive process. So rolled okay. copper usually is more costly. Uh, the ED copper, the more standard ED copper, like the 2.0 microns RMS that is not reverse treat, uh, that copper is, you know, it's probably one of the cheaper ones in the industry right now. And it works quite well for a lot of applications. If it's reverse treat, it is going to be more expensive. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a good scale to tell you for uh, Oh, that's okay. Um, but yeah, you're right. And I will be sending for our listeners, I'm going to be putting some links in the show notes and they have an amazing and it's absolutely free technology support hub site where you can go dig in more. There's uh, John has videos, there's white papers, there's calculators, there's all kinds of resources. So you can go learn more there and get some more information. Right. Um, I do have a little more on roughness. Okay, if, let's if see it. Look at it. So this is, I, I decided to try to explain roughness in two different ways. Uh, for the people dealing with high-speed digital, time domain, you know, propagation delay, eye diagrams, all that fun stuff, then they're usually interested in how copper can affect the time delay. And it most certainly can. And really what happens is the rougher the copper, the slower the wave. And what I'm showing here is an example of uh, two circuits built on the exact same material. And the only difference is copper. The blue curve is used in rolled copper, which is really smooth. And the gray curve is used in that high profile ED copper that I showed at 2.8 microns RMS. And really what this is an impedance curve. And the first glitch on the left is where the connector meets the circuit. And then going from left to right is the length of the circuit. And then at the very far right, it dives down to a very low impedance because it's shorted basically. And you can see the electrical length difference is about 70 picoseconds. And that's a pretty big difference. That's considering. substantial. Yeah, especially since this is the same dielectric material. This is the exact same material. And the only difference is surface roughness. And that equates to about a 0.55 difference in DK as the circuit would perceive it, even though the DK of the material is unchanged. Mm -hmm. So for high-speed digital, I usually like to think of the time domain things and propagation delays and things like that. And then for RF, this is uh, to look at more RF-related issues uh, like insertion loss. And again, this is the same three coppers that I showed a few slides back. Uh, 0.4 micron blue curve is rolled copper. Red is the standard ED and the purple is the high profile. And uh, going up pretty high in frequency, about 90 gigahertz. And this is using the exact same material, actually the same lot of material, same everything. Uh, it's four mil thick LCP materials. And you can see there's a big difference in insertion loss and that's really due to the roughness only. Mm. And, um, so that's pretty dramatic. And then also, if you wanna look at how phase works, uh, we have a routine where we test the circuit and we measure the phase angle of a long and short circuit. And from that, we can extract the DK on the Y axis, which is shown. And again, this is the same measurements as the last slide, actually. And it's just now we're collecting phase information. And from that, we're showing DK. 
and there's about a what 0.4 difference or so in DK difference. Mm. You, even though that's the same dielectric, there's only the only difference is surface roughness. And how the circuit perceives that is a slower wave is a higher dielectric constant. So the wave doesn't really know what it's zipping down that much. It just knows that it's slowed down. And if it's slowed down, then the calculations are going to give you a higher DK, even though again, right. the dielectric's the same DK. And you can see the smoothest curve, the light blue at the bottom, um, is uh, a lower dielectric constant than the red curve that's a little rougher, and the purple curve is the roughest copper and the highest dielectric constant. So slower wave being slowed by rougher copper causes a higher DK to be perceived, even though, again, dielectric material is the same. So I kind of like to show that because I'm a visual guy and I think everyone else I know. <laughs> I, I, I think, and I am too, and the way I simplify this for my non-engineering brain is just to think that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line, right? And if you put right. surface rock, it's more like taking a roller coaster, yeah, exactly. you know, from one end at a microscopic level, obviously. Yeah, yeah, sure. So that's, anyways, that's kind of how I, I get my head around it. Right. All right. That makes sense. Um, I think that's about all I have to show right now. Well, you mentioned um, low profile copper and and um and very low profile copper why don't we jump into that and i think you have some information also about ipc classifications and some of those why don't you uh, jump right. into that sure yes so for ipc they have different designators for the copper and uh to me and a lot of other people that's a little outdated we think uh and really what they have is a designator like uh, lp for low profile vlp for a very low profile and things like that. But if you actually uh, look at the uh, copper suppliers and the terms they use for the different copper, there's all kinds of terms in the industry and it does get a little confusing. Uh, for me, what I usually think of as a standard copper, uh, low profile and very low profile is kind of the general designators for ED copper. Uh, and then for rolled copper, um, as I remember, they only have one classification for that. And it's just because of the nature of how rolled copper is made, it's just naturally smooth. Uh, but ED copper, you'll see a lot of different designators in the industry by the copper supplier. And there's some move to trying to standardize that more. And right now, IPC has some terms, but they're not really being followed very well. Hmm. So it's one of those points that's a little confusing. So I didn't really want to get too much into that. Well, it's good to just know that. Yeah, true. You know, to make sure you do your homework and go check data sheets and... Right. Do your homework because it, 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 when in regards to at least copper types and profiles, technology as always moves fast. And sometimes right, right. it moves faster than our ability to keep up with standards, I, which I think is what's happened in this case. So, um, so also, I will say that VLP, if one copper supplier calls their copper a VLP and another copper supplier says the same thing, they don't necessarily have the same roughness. They're probably in the category of VLP, but it could be uh, like 0.9 for one copper and 1.2 for another. So there could be a significant difference, even though they're in that category. Hmm. So it's always suggested to really find out exactly what type of copper it is and uh, the roughness and, and understand that a little bit more, just not based on the designators only. Now, I know at Rogers, you guys interact with both OEMs, but your laminates ultimately end up in board fabricators. Right. So I imagine there's education that happens on both ends of that spectrum, but I'm thinking again about our audience, like, okay, I can read a data sheet, but what's the best way to kind of onboard this and make sure, you know, when you're designing, you're employing mm -hmm. best practices for performance and things that you're designing for. Right. Um, on the RF side of things, a lot of the software that's used, and there's many used in the industry that does uh, um, field solving, electromagnetic yep. field solving. And um, anyway, they will actually look at the, uh, they will give you uh, parameters like uh, the surface roughness and R sub Z or R sub Q or R okay. MOS. So a lot of times you can pick by what they have in their library, but you have to make sure what's in their library matches, you know, what the laminate supplier is using. For Rogers, we actually have on our website a document that shows all the surface roughness that we have for each one of the coppers on each one of our products. So that's probably the best way to go. So I think when selecting a material, 
uh, looking at the software parameters is fine, but you really do probably want to talk to the supplier or get on the supplier's website and really look at what they have for the roughness. Uh, again, the uh, the dozen errors that they talk about, like SQVLP and all these different things, are yeah. they're different. They mean different things to different suppliers. So it's really best to to get on the uh, I think the material suppliers website and look at what they really have for roughness. And then uh, a lot of the software you can go on there and actually change the roughness and uh, and you know basically the software will react to whatever that roughness is. So I think in okay. general, it'd be good to talk to the material suppliers, but also trust the software people as well. Right. But that's good to know that you can alter the surface roughness properties inside right. your field solvers. Okay. Yep. Good tip. Yep. Um, what did you want to dig into next? We talked about surface roughness. Um, oh, you know, if you don't mind, let me talk about roughness again. Sorry. Okay. That's a big topic. It's okay. It is a huge topic. But uh, one of the things I run into a good amount is that on very thin circuits, as in high-speed digital or a millimeter wave, very high frequency, is that the thinner the substrate is, the more sensitive the circuit's going to be to the surface roughness of the copper. So mm. if you have a thick substrate, like 30 mils thick, and the roughness of the copper is very rough, it won't really affect it much. But when the copper planes are really close together, in the case of like a really thin laminate, uh, then the copper planes have a pretty significant influence and the roughness does impact the performance a lot. So there's something about the copper surface roughness. Um, well, it's like anything. Copper is in a process, a manufacturing process that has variability. So that surface roughness is not always going to be 2.0 microns for the standard ED copper. And in that type of copper, in the case of that type of copper, it's usually about two microns average, plus or minus 0.2 or 0.3, depending on how it's made. And when the copper naturally is on the low side of the roughness, then that means you get a little better insertion loss and the phase is a little bit different. And when the copper is on the high side of the roughness, you get a lot more insertion loss. So if you have a really sensitive design using thin materials, it's not only good to know what the average roughness is, but also try to understand um, what to expect for the, the, uh, the variation of the roughness. And you can also put that into your, uh, in your software as well. So you can do a model with the average roughness, the minimum, the max, and it will show you what to expect for losses and whatever you're interested in. I know when I worked with a lot of RF engineers, I think this is a really helpful topic or high-speed digital as well, is that yeah. they'd model something in the software and then we'd build their boards and they'd like, hey, it doesn't act like what I simulated. And this sounds like one of those slippery slopes that right. could be at least part of the issue between what they simulate, you know, is not that's true. having that's the right parameters in there. So that's right. a good tip. Yeah, that's interesting. And also the other tricky thing is a multilayer. So if you have a, a multilayer like a strip line where you have uh, a Z-axis construction of ground signal ground, uh, a lot of times the circuit fabricator has the choice of foil for a foil lamb. And if they choose a foil that's different roughness than the rest of the laminate that's being used, then you get some funny results. And that's another thing that uh, someone should be mindful of. And if they can ask the fabricator to match the copper and roughness to the laminate, then you get a much more predictable uh, performance out of the circuit compared to the model. Mm. Okay. So it's things like that. That is good because, mm. yeah, pre-lamination, you know, micro etching or who knows, right. you know, what we're yeah. doing to, yeah. to create good ad adhesion during right. the lamination process. Um, you mentioned variations uh, for copper thickness, roughness, and etching. Right. Is that kind of what you were alluding to or? Yes, actually. Okay. Uh, yeah. So the roughness, I already explained that a little bit that, you know, mm -hmm. the same copper can have, you know, smoother or rougher. Mm -hmm. It's just the nature of it. Yeah. Uh, but also there are some issues with etching where I, I think if you just compare um, two very different coppers like rolled copper and the standard ED copper, and you kind of picture, how the circuit's going to be etched. You put photoresist on top, expose, develop what you want, and then you ideally would like to etch straight down through the copper. And whenever it's rolled copper uh, that has kind of a horizontal grain structure, it's kind of right. like your linked fingers. Now you have a path that the etchant has to go through these boundaries, so to speak. I see. And the sidewall is usually built but rougher on rolled copper. 
And sometimes mm. it's a little harder to get good definition of fine features with rolled copper. ED copper with uh, kind of a pickup fence, you know, you can etch straight down through those boundaries right. and you get a more clean sidewall. And in most cases, that clean versus rough sidewall is not that big of a deal until you get to a really narrow conductor or very high frequency. And at very high frequencies, you do have more current density on the sidewalls. So how rough that is does have an impact, believe it or not. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. That's not something I, I didn't know before. Yeah. So John, what is the, I'd like to explore more what the impact of copper roughness is not just on RF circuits, but on high-speed digital designs. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for high-speed digital designs, uh, especially at the rates they're getting to now, uh, they're starting to merge a lot <laughs> of their concepts with very high uh, frequency, like millimeter wave. So there's definitely some concerns there. Um, but anyway, for high-speed digital, there's different formats that the digital train, uh, you might call it, that's moving down the circuit. And one of them is called PAM4. And PAM4 is basically having uh, four different levels of ones and zeros all in one time domain. Hmm. That's a really simple way of saying it. But what that means is PAM4 is very sensitive to amplitude. So if you have these different ones and zeros stacked up and the amplitude is varying much, then that can confuse the system for ones and zeros. So for a PAM4 format, the insertion loss is very important, especially when you get the high frequencies uh, or high speed digital uh, rates, then uh, that's where the surface roughness can come into uh, actually cause uh, some issues with a PAM4 format, probably more so than the more traditional uh, NRZ or the PAM2 formats, hmm. because the PAM4 is uh, so sensitive to these amplitude differences. And that's also where the copper roughness variation could come into play as well. Uh, that the rougher the copper, the more variation you get naturally and smoother copper, less variation of the roughness. Mm -hmm. And when it's rougher, you would have more insertion loss and the eye would close some because of the amplitude being less. So there's things like that for high speed digital to think about. And specifically same question for RF. Right. Um, yeah, I guess I already talked about it that some, but it does okay, get a little fuzzy. Did, but well, it does get a little fuzzy with the skin depth that we talked about. So for skin depth, I'll hit on that again real quick, and you can, uh, you know, we can talk about that more if you want. But basically, what it is is uh, current density, and if you have uh, like a a round uh, copper tube and you have DC power on there, the cross section of that is completely the same current. You have the same current density everywhere. But on that round copper tube, if you go up in frequency and you have, I don't know, a thousand hertz or 10,000 hertz or something like that, then the current actually starts spreading out toward the skin and you have no current in the middle of it. And if you get to really mm -hmm. high frequency, you only have current on the skin of that copper tube. And in mm -hmm. the middle, there's absolutely no current at all right. uh, as a cross-sectional view. Uh, so what happens is for copper, when you have a chunk of copper and a roughened area below, mm -hmm. when it gets higher and higher frequency, basically that copper, uh, the current density is getting thinner and thinner and thinner until it finally gets to the point where it's just using the roughened surface only. So oh, there interesting. Is, yeah, so it's really frequency dependent. So the copper surface roughness doesn't matter as much at lower frequency because it's using so much of the copper and a lot of the bulk copper is being used. But when you get the really high frequency, it's just right across the skin. The, the skin depth is so thin that it's just using the roughened only. Then that's where you, you start having a lot of effects uh, mm -hmm. due to the roughness. So maybe that's too much information. I don't know. But no, I really, <laughs> I really liked that, you know, more depth on that than, than what I'd said earlier. It's an important topic. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I'll make sure to try to circle back with you and, and get something to um, put into the show notes for our listeners. Right, well, sure. John, this has been like drinking from the fire hose, but I find it really <laughs> interesting and hopefully our listeners will too. Good. So um, before I let you go, like, where do we go from here? Right. This yeah. is always changing. And I know Rogers is always kind of on the forefront of innovation. So like what's up and coming in the, in the copper world and, yeah. and what's driving that? 
All right, what's next? <laughs> well, we're always looking at other things. Uh, and just by the nature of how printed circuit boards are made, it'd be nice to use, you know, silver or all kinds of different things, but you have to be able to process it and go through the, the normal etching and different processes. So we are looking at different coppers and copper with different treatments for different reasons and things like that. Uh, one of the bigger drives though, because there's so many uh, millimeter wave applications now, obviously there's millimeter wave applications for the automotive radar at 77 gigahertz. Mm. But there's also a fair amount of backhaul at 60 gigahertz. There's some 5G around 40 gigahertz. So all these uh, very high frequency applications, they normally need the circuit geometry to be etched very uh, accurately. And they also have usually smaller features as well. And that can be done better if the copper is thin. And what's been happening uh, for the last couple of years, especially for the 77 gigahertz automotive radar circuits is they will take our laminate that's half ounce. And first thing they do is try to go through, uh, I guess I'd call it a controlled micro etch and they try to reduce the copper thickness. Mm -hmm. So then as they go through the process of making the circuit, they're starting off with a thinner copper and that way they can etch the geometry uh, more accurately, a little more cleaner too. Hmm. So what we've been doing is uh, looking at much thinner copper. So we've been looking at some really thin things like two micron and we're still working on that, but that's out there a little ways, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have uh, done a lot of work with nine micron, which is a quarter ounce. And that does make a big difference with uh, etching and accuracy of etching. And that's available on uh, one of our products already, the CLT MW product. And um, that is used at very high frequencies, uh, millimeter wave, and even high-speed digital for that matter. Hmm, interesting. So that's the latest, I guess, that we're working on. Okay, well, that sounds really interesting and good. And um, our listeners can find information about that also on the Technology Support Hub? Right. Okay, very good. And for our listeners, I cannot, I, I've pitched it before, and I pitch it again, and from the <laughs> sincerity of my heart. Um, the technology support hub is free. There's amazing tools in there. Great knowledge base for you there. White papers. Um, John does a sort of, what do you call it? Coonrod's corners. Like, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It's like a little vlog, an educational vlog that he yeah. does. Just, um, short videos. just short videos where, yeah. you know, you have quick takeaways, not spend a lot of your time. So right. um, just, I'm going to put the, the link to technology support hub below and to their webpage and, and everything I can find for you. So John, I want to thank you again for sharing your depth of knowledge and geeking out with me about copper today. <laughs> My pleasure. To our audience. Thanks so much for joining us today. Remember to go over and check out those show notes later and always remember to like, subscribe, give us a comment. It really helps others find this podcast and helps us to continue to find great guests like John Coonrod. We will see you next week. And until then, remember to stay healthy, stay safe, and always remember to stay on track. Stay on track.